Jager. Jager, everyone? Jager. So welcome to this minute, everyone. Uh, minute 12, uh, I'm going to host today. And uh, together we have with us, uh, as ever, Priyanka Mike. And we are joined today by Natalia. So welcome, Natalia, to, to the Awake Minute by Minute podcast. Maybe you would like to introduce yourself and say how you know the, the group. Yes. Hello, my name is Natalia. I've been a devotee of SRF of Yogananda for around maybe five years or six. And lately I have been very involved in Yogananda Seva and there I met Priyank. And I, I just listened to this post, post podcast and I, I told him about it and he just invited me. <laughs> so I'm here. I, I, I wanted Natalia because she's got she's got such a cool sounding voice. I thought that that is a podcast voice if ever I heard one. <laughs> <laughs> and and obviously she's got a lot of a uh, lot of lovely devotion to offer this uh, this service. Natalia, which country are you from? I'm from Colombia in South America. We learned something new. I didn't know that you were only five or six years into this uh, SRF or yoga on the journey. That's nice. Yes, to hear. in this lifetime, I, I ah very <laughs> good. She's she's got all the answers. Spot on. Spot on. How, how did you get onto the path, Natalia? Again, can you repeat? How, how did you get onto the path five or six years ago? Wow, that's such a long story. You want me to go into Make, the path? Do I'll the short version. Yeah. <laughs> we we need, need to hear it. It's a long, form, long format podcast. So yeah. yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's that's true. <laughs> so there was a moment in my life that I just had these big questions of purpose of life and who was I really? I didn't identify myself like, as I'm the daughter of my mom and my dad or this professional who's a lawyer. I, I had a deeper questions of who was I and what was the purpose of my life. And um, I was desperately looking for the real unconditional love and I couldn't find it anywhere. So um, I started this journey um, starting with books um, I don't know if you guys have heard of A Course in Miracles. No, no. no. Mike is nodding like a yes. <laughs> so, yeah, I've heard of it, but I don't know much about it. Yeah, it's a book that it, it's said to be Jesus, like it transmitted it to a psychiatrist in New York. And it's a very beautiful book. And I, th that's how I started my, my spiritual, like I've always been very Catholic and devotional and I've, felt very close to Jesus, to Virgin Mary, to the angels, to whatever. But I was always through the Catholic path. And at some point I just felt I needed more answers or I needed to feel a love that I was not finding through the Catholic path. I still respect it. I, I completely respect whoever is Catholic. My mom is a devout Catholic and Same here. I completely understand that. But um, I don't know, I was, craving for some love that I was not finding. And at some point I went to a place in Big Sur, California. And, and it's mm -hmm. a holistic place and it has wonderful nature. Um, there's, it has hot springs, it has um, a cliff. You can see all the sea and all the sunsets. And that was a profounding healing place for me. And there I met a woman who was called Gangaji. And um, she is a spiritual teacher from California and she comes from the lineage. I, I wouldn't call it a lineage, but because some people don't say there's a lineage, but from the same line at least of uh, Ramana Maharshi. And in her presence, I could sense what I was looking for. I could sense uh, an unconditional love, a deep peace. Deep peace. And uh, that really struck me and made me feel like this is what is meant life to be so I, mm -hmm. I just want to go for that and I started a spiritual search very intensely for many years and at some point I was completely lost <laughs> I didn't know like for even I even left my career for a while because I felt that if I just went back to to my lawyer practice I would just get into that and 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 get a master and then get married and stuff. And, and I just felt that I was needing something else. And at some point, um, 
I felt completely lost because I didn't find what I was looking and I lost my career somehow or I didn't nurture it. So yeah, I was very, very nervous and anxious. And at this moment I found Bikram Yoga. And I know you guys talked about Bikram um, some episodes ago. And um, for me, it was my lifesaver at the time. It helped me a lot. Like, as I said, my mind was very anxious at that time. Like I was trying to, to find God, but I couldn't find him. Uh, and at the same time, I was not in a material, materialistic um, like level. Like in the material world, I was also not grounded. So, and the Bikram yoga started to calm me down a lot. Um, I could sense a sense of purpose after every Bikram class and a sense of strong willpower and confidence and that kept me going so after a while i decided even to become a teacher of bikram yoga and um i remember in every of bikram's uh, lectures he had a, a picture of master and a picture of vishnu gosh mm -hmm. and um of course like i could sense there was something very devotional and there was something that attracted me but i could also sense the dark part of the bikram yoga that something was not completely on and um but the thing is that i got i got the autobiography of a yogi in the bikram yoga training and uh when i read it i just felt it like master was like his his laugh life path was similar to some of my journeys like he was looking for something and i it, it was a sensation like oh finally someone gets what i'm going through like mm -hmm. this spiritual quest that no one understands. I couldn't verbalize it to almost no one. Like my family was somehow supportive, but at the same time they were like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. um, my friends too, like I, they never said anything, but you could sense it in, in, the, in the energy. And um, when I read the autobiography, it was such a relief. Like it was like, oh my God, I'm not crazy. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, this makes sense at some level. And yeah. Um, yeah, and I remember like when I when I saw the figure of Sri Yuteswar and how he he taught Master to still be spiritual and he understood his spiritual inquiries and quest, but at the same time he helped him in this in the material world, like mm -hmm. go and get go and go to your family, go back and get a university degree, all those stuff. And I felt like oh my god, I need a Sri Yuteswar in my life. <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah so that's the summary of of how it happened like then after some time i went to the bogota's meditation center and uh oh i felt so much peace immediately i like to my bones i could feel the peace of the mm -hmm. place and i could i i could go in in into deep meditation without having any technique it's very mm -hmm. natural and um I don't know. I just sense like this is my place, and and since then I never stopped. Mm -hmm. you, you're home. You're right home. It's funny, you, you know. You, you made your, your comment about your friends and families kind of thinking you, should, you know you've gone crazy or something. <laughs> like uh, from from the outside in, it's like a some form of a breakdown of sorts. But really, it's a breakthrough for me. You know, this kind of becoming. Mm. Um, having a thirst, you know, your, your outside world can break down very quickly. That's yeah. really giving space for something new to grow. You know, I, I, I experienced that myself, so I can really relate, relate to your story. And Thalia, so thanks, thanks for sharing. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. So you got onto the uh, autobiography through, through Big Room. Uh, yeah. But how, how did you, when was the first time you saw the movie, Awake? <laughs> the other day I was thinking about this and I, the first time I remember seeing it was in a theater in Bogota, like when they publicly presented. I don't remember if I saw it before privately, but that's that's the first memory I have. And I remember crying like a baby. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and there was someone at my side and she looked at me like, what's going on? <laughs> and, I cried, and I cried and I cried. Awesome. And so, sorry, where are you now? I, I should, I'm I in Colombia. 
here in Columbia. Awesome. It looks so sunny out there. And I'm, I'm yes, sitting here you know. coming up to summer. I was just pouring with rain and all about it. Oh, that's so oh, awesome. Wow. Oh, wow. Look at that. Natalia showing a beautiful view of the uh, uh, little street or big street, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you get a chance to see that on the, on the YouTube or something, check, check it out. You get transported into a different world right now. It's, <laughs> you know, I, I live in Ireland, by the way, Natalia. So they, they call it the Emerald Isle. Because it rains all the time, so it's always clean. Oh, really? <laughs> so, yeah, well, thanks, that, thanks for showing me some really Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. well, swings and roundabouts. But like, thank, mm -hmm. thanks, thanks for joining. That's awesome uh, for sharing your your story and and um, really, you know, this this minute um, it transfers over from the last minute, so we can we can jump into the the analysis of it um, because we we have so much to talk about really in this minute and really uh it, it's it, it's it's a minute that really delves into the, the story of yogananda and how he transitioned into uh the full srf uh organization and foundation um so let's let's begin shall we so we we start the minute off uh with a image of uh, anand mehotra and um, so Anand Mehotra, uh, I can kind of quickly uh, say who he is. I think it's the first time, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, Yeah. Um, that he's been in the, the film, right? So yep. yeah, a, a quick search, you know, you'll find a pretty impressive Instagram presence. Uh, <laughs> so he's got a few different bits and pieces going on for sure. And it looks quite, um, quite successful. So he's uh, as, as described in his Instagram, a Himalayan master, a yoga pedantic pioneer, uh, and he's an author as well but of a book or two. And he's the founder of Sattva Yoga Academy and Sattva Yoga itself. So go check him out if uh, if you wish uh, on, on Instagram, the Anand Mahotra. So uh, Anand Mahotra here, he uh, says, it's scary to the mind. I think the first thing said and this is a, uh, said with a sharp breath in, oh my God. And this is really referring to the prior minute uh, where Yogananda had visions during his meditation of seeing America. And this was uh, Anand's response to how Yogananda must have felt. So it's quite scary to the mind and, and uh, oh my God, uh, what's, what's going to happen? What's going to become of me? Um, so Yogananda did express some uh, I, I don't know, how would you say it? <laughs> Some, he was a bit reserved about going to, the, going to the America. He, he, quite, he seemed quite happy to stay in India at the time. But uh, we've reflected something of, uh, uh, we've reflected on this somewhat in the previous minute. But Natalia, I'll go to you. What, what's, your, what's your reflections on this comment? Do you think Yogananda was scared? Do you think he was saying, oh my God, you know, uh, in, his, in his visions of seeing America? Yes, I like. What I, what I sense from that scene is like, I understand that sensation of being like in a spiritual comfort and being scared to step in into a material world. That's like what mm -hmm. I was experienced when I was in my journey. And I think that's what he was experienced somehow. Like he was in India, spiritual world, and he was very good in, in a great, very good place there. And now he was forced or somehow like his mission was to go to the United States and bring that um, spiritual part to a materialistic world. And I understand that that must be very scary. I would be scared too. Mm. Yeah, quite the responsibility, isn't it? Um, do, do, we, do we think in general that Yogananda had the fear, you know, this scared kind of response? Or do you think it was more the sense of responsibility and the, and the weight of that compared to what he kind of wanted to do, which was run off to the Himalayas at the time? I would see it more like a resistance, like, oh my God, do I really need to do this? Like, really? <laughs> that 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 is my my perception of. It's not scared. I I don't think that Yogananda was a fearful person. He was he was a warrior. Right? So. Yeah, and well, in the autobiography, we we know the story that he prayed until he got Babaji's reaffirmation. No, so I feel it, it was more that like he wanted to make sure he was doing the right thing and it was really his mission he was not making it up in his mind and um i i think it was more that like he he didn't want to lose and that's 
I, I can really identify with that because in my journey, I, I think I, I was in some moment in a place where I, I have built like a spiritual treasure and I was so scared to step in into the world and lose it. And so I don't know, maybe at some level, Yogananda had something similar, like he had his material treasure and he didn't, didn't want to go to a materialistic world that would not understand him, that um, mm -hmm. might make him lose this connection, this deep connection yeah. to, to the divine. That's a, that's a really good insight actually, because Yogananda talks about that a lot, doesn't he? That your environment can count for more than your will. Yeah. Right. Even at times it's so powerful, like you, you have to be really careful who you surround yourself and associate yourself with. So he's going from the spiritual land of India to kind of seeing, you know, all these images of people in the, in America. And it's very materialistic. Right. So, yeah, you're quite right. I think that's, that's a really lovely insight. Mike, Mike Priyak, do you have a, any comments on what Anand said? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you also have to see it from his perspective a little bit. Right. Like we see him. We read the autobiography and see this impressive life, right? But like life unfolds itself as you go, right? So in the beginning, I mean, he was an avatar. He might have known it all from the beginning, but at least in a kind of human relatable way, he discovered things one by one, right? So imagine you go, you build up this school, you have those beautiful children um, in Ranchi and and you, you you're trying to revolutionize how to how to teach them, like teach them spiritual values from the beginning. And you probably grow fond of them as well. And then here comes Divine Mother and says, now you're going somewhere else now. Yeah. But, yeah. So this is like, I'm, I'm, I can imagine that, that there, there must have been some, uh, at first, some, some kind of, um, uh, um, what is the right word? Maybe, I, I don't think he was anxious, like Natalia said, he was fearless, but he was, probably concerned like what will happen of his work here and everything like this was ma like ma a massive change in his life obviously mm -hmm. yeah. yeah agreed so i think i think he's he's gone to a lot of effort to humanize himself and the other gurus in the um, autobiography so scary to the mind that's what that's what that means to me so for us we would be anxious scared apprehensive all those all that stuff about such a massive vision or change in your life and he, he he's he's saying he's kind of saying that well it's inspiring that he him as a as a guru also went through such things so again i think we've covered this in the past but we should also be a bit easier on ourselves with with uh, with such emotions mm -hmm. it's part of this uh, part of this life for us yeah yeah there's some souls in it for sure and we, we actually see in the next image of, um, uh, of, of this minute, a really cool picture. Uh, and I believe, uh, Priyank, you, uh, yes. you can tell us a little bit more about it. Yes, I do. Um, so this, it's in, it's in the book, the Awake book. So it says, it's uh, defined the, the pictures of uh, a young Yogananda with a very large group of boys and a few elderly statesmen like people um, so so the picture annotation says students and teachers of brahmacharya vidyala kazimbazar palace ranchi soon after the school was founded uh, left to the center is shastri mahashaya center is the maharaja sri manindra chandra nandi and he's the patron of the school and then there's swami yogananda so yeah so there's some uh, dignitaries there with him in that image and uh, it's it's if you guys haven't seen this image it's uh, it's this unkept kind of image of Yogananda which we don't have many of such ones actually his, his hair is all over the place and he's got a, you know a beard that's pretty out of control so he, he looks like a very classical mystic that you might just you know see in in the northern plains of the Himalayas let alone founding founding a school in um in Ranchi, so we might, we might as well let's let's talk about that uh, found that 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 uh, patron. So the patron was um, Sri Manindra Chandra Nandi, who was the Maharaja of Kasim Bazar. So he was obviously this is the time where we still had Maharajas or kings, uh, as it were. And he said, um, I was able to transfer my fast-growing group to Ranchi, this town to Bihar, uh, Bihar, about two hundred miles from Calcutta. 
and is blessed with one of the most healthful climates in India. The Kazim Bazaar Palace in Ranchi became the main building for the new school, which is called Yogoda Satsang Brahmachari Vidyala, Vidyalaya, Vidyalaya, which means a school. Vidya means learning. Avidya is individual delusion. So yeah, Vidya is learning. Oh, cool. And Yogananda, looking at him there, you did say he's a little bit scruffy. It's, um, I looked at it and thought, oh, is this really what he wanted to be like? And then he kind of went to the US and he realized he had to kind of clean up his image. <laughs> I actually love that picture of Master. Like, it's yeah. one of yeah. my, yeah. I feel his strength in full power. <laughs> yeah, I actually, I actually cropped it out. So for anybody, should I, shall I share it online? Yes. And please. to anybody um, uh, who's who's wanting to to see what we're looking at, here's the picture of Master. Um, and for anybody listening, sorry, we did just describe it to you, but for uh, for purposes of people watching, um, this is this is such an awesome picture because he looks uh, very uh, meditative, in, in my opinion, just looking at this picture and. Um, quite different. I think we mentioned before how different he can look from picture to picture. Yes. And, and to me, he looks so different here. Uh, you know, with this long flowing hair, uh, you know, in, in full force. And then and then the beard really um, uh, looks quite established there as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, quite different from the, you know, having to fit into the, to the United States culture. Yep. I think it's um, pretty cool. Yeah, awesome. So, not often, yeah, we'll, we'll uh, continue then. Um, uh, we have uh, scenes of, of Brother uh, Vishwananda, um, and he's, you know, purposefully walking from scene to scene, and then we kind of follow him through a couple of different scenes, uh, and you can hear his, his, uh, his voice on the voiceover saying, imagine in your own life having a message so strong that it totally changes your life in a moment. And uh, this... This is him walking through uh, the Yogananda's How to Live School. Uh, and they're very beautiful scenes that we see, very idyllic settings. And um, yeah, uh, Brother Vish Vishwananda is, like I said, walking very purposely towards what looks to be a temple. Um, so, so we see him sitting at the edge of this temple uh, and he, he's, um, he's saying, and at this time, he had been here for about three years and probably thought that this was his life's work. And he's referring to Yogananda here. So really takes us back to Yogananda in his, in his twenties, I believe this would have been, uh, when he had kind of um, really uh, established himself to, to what he thought might have thought was his life's work to build these how to live schools. So he's re uh, reflecting on this uh, with some fondness. Um, but Brother Vishwananda, Natalia, we, we mentioned it before, but maybe you can share some of your reflections and, and thoughts on him. Well, the first time I saw him was in the Awake movie, and I instantly feel connected to him. And I remember that the first time I went to Mother Center, I saw him. <laughs> I, was like, I felt like his friend, and I was like going to approach him, and then something stopped me, like, no, maybe you should. <laughs> and uh, I like, I remember that for for a while I thought he was the vice president of SRF and, and recently he became and and I said like oh wasn't he <laughs> right? uh -huh. so I, I feel I feel very connected to him I I also I remember that I stayed recently in in a devotee's house near near to um, the mother center mm -hmm. and and she could tell me stories of brother Vishwananda and and how he loves Indian food like homemade Indian food. And I don't know, I feel very close to him somehow. Awesome. And um, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. Uh, looking at him, I think he's got a very, he's got a very soulful touch to his voice, very considered, very sort of deep, meaningful eyes. You know, you can, you can really sense uh, the peace and stillness within him. I, I, I love just hearing his voice here and it, it's, it's such a lovely, um, setting as well to see him walking through uh, and you can see people turning their heads kind of you know looking at him and, and I imagine it's because of the garm that he's wearing um, yeah. uh, which uh, he must stand out um, from the crowds but uh, what, what's what's your take uh, Mike uh, and Priyank on, on these scenes 
what did what did you think when you saw them uh it looks a bit like a like a paradise right like you go mm -hmm. there you talk about those they talk about a bit about those how to live schools and then they go like there it is already so and master started it already in 1920 right so it has been going on there for a long time and the, there are so many elements to it right the, one of them is for example they they talked about uh Guruji talks about like um having uh, teaching children outside in nature and it's like they have this beautiful garden um in in ranchi in the on the ashram grounds and also next to the school and then when you see brother vishwananda walk through this i mean he's like the perfect person to incorporate this i can totally imagine him as like some kind of principal of the school or something like this like <laughs> i because he has this like he has like in his voice like he has this kind of authority but also this compassion for children i can totally see how if if you're young and brother vishwananda comes in front of you and wants to teach you something like you are captivated by him because he's a very strong personality and and um yeah i kind of feel like he's he's like the best person to kind of tell us what a how to live school looks like yeah yeah headmaster is probably quite a, a very loving headmaster you do yeah. want to sit, pay, pay attention to him that's awesome and Priyank. yes so you <clears throat> you mentioned um he's at a temple so that temple is called the smriti mandir and uh it's a, it is i'll read about it paramahansa yogananda Smriti Mandir is a memorial shrine. Um, the mandir stands, mandir is, means temple. The mandir stands at the sacred spot in the ashram precincts where Guru Deva had a vision of going to America exactly 100 years ago in 1920. Describing this vision in the autobiography, Paramahansa writes, and uh, we heard America, surely these people are Americans. This was my thought as the panorama of Western faces passed before my inward view. Uh, so this iconic all marble octagonal temple was dedicated in 1995, March 22nd, by Swami Anandamoy Giri, who we all we know uh, as the, one of the beloved direct disciples of uh, Yogananda. Awesome. It's, I looked at this temple and I thought it was so decorative and I just wondered you know, uh, even looking at it, like, what's it made of? It, it was so beautiful. Um, and there's some really cool symbols and flower uh, flower decorations through it as well. Uh, and I'm, I'm looking at this, and is that a lotus, I think, just by, um, uh, at, at, the, at the bottom of one of the pillars? I think it might be some sort of lotus petal, but it, it looks beautiful. I, if I think you guys have been there, I don't know, um natalia or has anybody been there sorry i should ask i haven't no <clears throat> okay but it's a very the, um, it's a very strange design for a temple octagonal um in in mm. india the temples aren't usually of that geometry so uh, it, it that could be one of the reasons why it's uh, it looks so compelling and intriguing uh, i think yeah. the um, the last uh, convocation uh, the indian Kirtans that had them, I think, inside that um, inside that temple, and obviously it's absolutely beautiful. And they've got this absolutely lovely painting of uh, Yogananda life size, pretty much uh, sitting and meditating at the uh, center shrine. So it's really looks like a really powerful place, especially if this is the place where he had this vision and his destination, or you know, destiny was being fulfilled of, of going to mm -hmm. the west. Mm -hmm. Lovely and and. So we get to the, the next part and really the, the, the main talking points of, of <clears> this minute, which comes in the, in the form of actually another close-up of Yogananda's uh, rather hairier face than, than what we're used to. But um, uh, the voiceover of, of Yogananda um, said by, said by Anupam Kerr uh, says, I had founded a school following the educational idea, ideals of the Rishis whose forest ashrams had been the ancient seat of learning, overcoming the restlessness of the body and mind by certain concentration techniques, achieved astonishing results. And so I'll pause there because as he says this, there are some images and even videos which we can 
get to and discuss in a minute. But uh, what's uh, Priyank? What, what's what's your thoughts on on the Yogananda's words there? Um, yeah, beautiful. Um, I, I I found another section of the autobiography. I might, if I may read that as well. So he actually started um, a small school before this big school. So this, this is what it says in the autobiography. He says, the ideal of right education for youth had always been very close to my heart. I saw clearly the arid results of ordinary instruction aimed at developing the body and intellect only. Moral and spiritual values without whose appreciation no man can approach happiness were yet lacking in the formal curriculum. I determined to found a school where young boys could develop a full stature of manhood. My first step in that direction was made with seven children in Bihika, a small country site in Bengal. Uh, can you imagine uh, being <laughs> one of those seven kids? <laughs> oh, wow. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I think we, we discussed this actually, Mike. I think you were probably there when your sister was there. Um, school, the, the school in London, if you, uh, one of our London Centre Young Adults meetings. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we, um, we discussed this and we said... Um, yeah, one of the things I said was like if you if I remember my education and my life at school, especially when I was that uh, that young, um, then I don't remember the classrooms obviously all phase out kind of blurry, but I remember distinctly anything nature related that I did. So, for example, one of my schools that I went to had a, had a very nice pond, and it had you know all the animals that were uh, that are associated with the pond, like you know newts and frogs and dragonflies and all those things and for our science class we actually went out and you know with our nets caught these various things and yeah so we we did the like live analysis of of the science class and that was you know that I was so young but it's so like I can recount various elements of that class because it was practical it was there it was in nature it was real and similarly like uh, I think the next week we had like some owls came in and we, they were showing us the difference between owls and eagles and other birds of prey. And that even that even, I can still remember, like they made the owl fly over all of our heads, just like literally two feet above our heads. And they said, did you hear that? Did you feel that? And none of us did. And and they said, this is the, this is the, majestic, the majestic thing about owls that you won't hear them you know their feathers are made and their flight is such that the prey won't be able to detect that it's anywhere within the sight and I you know I can just recount that story and these these stories where like you're in nature and you're observing these things are so much more powerful than anything you can get from a textbook and uh, what our education system as as you just described is yeah yeah it's it's very different uh, how is how is the school system in in Colombia is it, is it something Remotely well, similar to this? In Colombia, well, there are various uh, school systems. Recently, there have been uh, uh, like um, a wave of new alternative education systems. Um, but I, I wanted to comment on, on the, like, the scene and also on what Priyank read, because that's right, one of the things that struck me when I, when I read the autobiography of a yogi. But because one of the fe feelings that I was uh, sensing when I was in my own spiritual journey and struggles was the sensation of not being equipped with the techniques or whatever I needed to cope with what I was feeling. And um, I also remember feeling that like life was like gave you the tools to be successful materially, but it didn't help you on, on, on the other tools to, to really cope with life. And, and I really questioned that to the level that I became a preschool teacher in my own school. Like when I, when I left law in my spiritual search, I was for a while just doing nothing. And then I started, okay, I have to find new ways to reinvent my, myself. And one of the first things that I, I tried was to be a preschool school in my, my school. And I tried in the preschool because they told me that they were trying a new method of education that's called a um, regia media, that it was invented after World War II. And it's like, it is more holistic. It, it, like it, it somehow wants to recognize the spirit and, and also like the creative part of human being and, and the other dimensions of the human being. And I loved that idea. And I, I tried to be a teacher. I was not successful. <laughs> <laughs> but I could really resonate with that inquiry and that uh, search, that, that purpose that Master had for uh, building an education that 
could acknowledge all the dimensions of human beings and not only giving them giving them the the math the english the whatever resources you need to to go into the rat race that is what i was kind of trying to get away from i didn't want the rat race i, I wanted to live a life full of meaning and purpose mm -hmm. and and that's requires a different kind of education and as i was saying like i feel in colombia right now there are some schools that are trying to um, incorporate other views. My, my school is very Catholic, so I cannot say that they didn't give me spiritual resources or whatever, but it was not what I was needing uh, afterwards in my life, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we need more of these schools. Uh, I, I, I did a quick search. Um, uh, on, on this online, just to see what was really out there, on, you know, in the world of the, uh, the internet. And uh, I was on the yogananda and parenting.com website and uh, really, really interesting website. And there's a blog there that um, I can, I can read from because uh, in Yogananda's words, I thought this was uh, pretty insightful, but he says many college graduates after leaving their universities are often found with a top heavy book inflated head <laughs> and are unable to walk straight in the path of life to, uh, uh, to their legs of will and self-control being almost paralyzed through disuse. Uh, and I thought that was such a, a great opening opening line. It does, it does go on here, but that's... Um, very typical of Yogananda, straight to the point, but in a very loving way. Um, so they tumble headlong into the pit of wrong marriage, sex misuse, inordinate, inordinate dollar craving and business failure. They had not yet been taught any other use of their college sharpened mental blades of smartness, except to hurt themselves. Many young men seem to take pleasure in doing those things which attract their own disadvantage and suffering in the end. Last uh, last year, uh, and this was at the time of writing, I'm not sure when that was, but uh, in America, young men ranging from the year, years of 15 to 30 stole $1 billion by the hold up method. And that's that's a lot of money back, uh, certainly back then. Um, who was responsible, uh, Yogananda asks, we, all of us, uh, they are so vicious uh, who do not prevent the spread of vice. Uh, they are also vicious who do not prevent the spread of vice and teach others to be uh, virtuous through their example. Schools, colleges and society have not scientifically tried to prevent crime by eliminating its true mental cause. Mm. I thought that was a real insightful message. Natalia, you know, you've been in the system. <laughs> What's yes. your thoughts? The, the last part you just read, the part of changing the, the causes of criminal activity touches me a lot because I live in Colombia and Colombia is a very violent place. Mm -hmm. And it has, it has also been one of my triggers for the spiritual journey because I feel like what is the way to change this from the base, from the cause? And uh, I do feel that spirituality uh, has a major role in it. Unfortunately, I don't know how to how to give it to the world, to these kind of people. I, for the moment, I just pray for them, but I have asked myself how. I, I even have a friend that has a yoga foundation for, for people who are in jails and, and, and that kind of stuff. And she does a marvelous work, work with that. Um, mm -hmm. But she's from another uh, spiritual lineage. So, so I, I haven't been so, so involved. And I know a devotee from Yogananda that has something related in the I think in the United States so it's something that has caught my attention and, and you just read it and, and and I feel that I wanted to comment on that mm -hmm. oh, that's good I mean I, I'm glad I'm glad you said um you asked yourself the question of how can you solve it because Yogananda does you know he gives a, a, an answer actually in, in this next paragraph I'll, I'll quickly read this um, I consider properly organized schools as gardens where infant souls are grown and nurtured. The gardens should be well selected and cooperated with by parents and the public. The teachers should never be neglected for they are soul molder, molders. The care and spiritual nourishment of the early life of a human plant usually determines its later development. And I just thought that that was such an epic uh, insight into what schools really should and could be. 
and my, therein might lie the answer that the soul molders is is the thing that I picked up on there because each individual should have their soul flourish in their own individual unique way. And Yogananda's How to Live Schools is, is uh, gearing up for that, right? So, so we can get delve into it in a little bit more detail, but uh, it, it's very, very different from the system that we have today where it's quite a collective system of churning numbers through and it, it's worked fa fabulously to, to some degree. But this is very individual soul molders of, of the individuals. Priyank, uh, Mike, what, what are your comments on that? What do you say to people who say spirituality can come later and right now I'm going to get my grades and get into the right job and all that kind of stuff? It's for whenever you're 50 and up. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say about that? Because my, uh, I've had some relatives that have posed that. They'll use that as an excuse. Pass, Mike. Sorry. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, I like this whole. I feel like the 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 more modern schools they have a lot in in common. Like there's many different ways of 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 like new school systems. Like like Natalia mentioned Reggio Emilia, right? And like I, for example, as a kid, I went to a Montessori school. Um, which was interesting at the time. And, and my parents were back then also considering Rudolf Steiner schools, which are also, at least in the US, they're very popular um, um, amongst some people. And um, I feel like they all have in common that you take, you like you um, use a bit less authority and you try to like, um, service the kids a bit more individually, like see what kind of talents they have and try to um, let them express their uniqueness a bit more. And I feel like that is very important because I feel like our school system is like a bit backwards. I feel like we have evolved in a lot of ways as a society, but our school system is lagging a bit behind and it's showing like Guruji says, it's showing that we lack some basic um, uh, knowledge when we come out of school. We know a lot, we, I mean, not, not a lot, but we know some math and we know how to write, but we, we don't know much about our minds. We know basically nothing about spirituality. And I feel like we also don't know about how to express ourselves or how to be happy. Um, there's this, um, like because you mentioned earlier the, the that section where he says the school should be like a garden. Um, there's this um, this chapter on Rabindranath Tagore. Um, I want to read a little bit from there because I that was interesting when I read that. Um, so he was talk he was like talking to Tagore and he says Tagore told me of his own early educational struggles that um, he said I fled from school. After the fifth grade, he said laughing, I could readily understand how his innate poetic delicacy would be affronted by the dreary disciplinary atmosphere of a schoolroom. That is why I opened Santimikitan under the uh, shady trees and the glories of the sky. He mentioned eloquently to a little group studying in the beautiful garden. A child is in his natural setting amidst the flowers and the songbirds. There he may more easily express the hidden wealth of his individual endowment. True education is not pumped and crammed in from outward sources, but aids in bringing to the surface the infinite hoard of wisdom within. I agreed and added, in ordinary schools, the idealistic um, hero-worshipping instinct of the young and starved on an exclusive diet of statistics and chronological errors. And um, Guruji goes on like commenting on it. And he says he, he um, agrees with Tagore that you need to have more like Tagore, obviously he was a poet, he was an artist. So he had a lot of emphasis on art and Guruji agrees with this. And then he, on top of it, he says that you also need to add spirituality 
to to the to the mix and this is this is where even our modern schools are still lacking that I, I don't see that anywhere i mean i see like natalia said again like like there are catholic schools and but i don't feel like they have a holistic enough approach i feel like they use the same approach we use for school proper and just try to pump catholic history into your into your brain into your mind and i don't see that as beneficial as it could be so that's why those how to live schools in ranchi are amazing thing and like Priyank said, being one of those first seven kids that went to Dihika, that must have been amazing. Yeah, I think the, the closest thing I had to how to live uh, at my school, it was a great, great school. I'm, I'm not here to, to run, run this name in the ground or anything, but it was home economics. And we, we essentially learned how to bake a, or make a cheesecake. That was fantastic. <laughs> that, was, that was probably the closest. No, it's... Um, it is amazing how uh, the spiritual wealth is quite um, quite lacking in in the sense of education. Um, uh, and my uh, spiritual um, or religious education at my school looked at the differences between the religions rather than what 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 is the purpose and crux of religions and the commonality between them. So looking back, it's quite. Of seeing, I think Natalia, like yourself, I, I knew something was up at the time, <laughs> but I didn't quite have, have the comprehension um, ability to really pick it out. But yeah, I wanted to share something. I remember when I went back to my school to teach, I had a, an interview with the principal, who has mm -hmm. been like the same principal of my school the whole life. Like she's the iconic figure of my school, and um, I remember telling her that I, I felt that schools needed these you know, other dimensions of, of, the, of the human being to be incorporated. And mm -hmm. I, I, I didn't know how, how well she digested, but I remember that after maybe three or four years, I met her again and she asked me again, like, what do you, do you still think this? And I also remember having the sensation of like, how can I ask her to give something that maybe she, she doesn't have? Like she has not experienced. Like she, she's a Catholic. She's a very good person. She's very professional. Like she, I know that from her capacity, she has offered the best school system. She, mm -hmm. she, she, she's able to. So that's where I, I question myself. Like, how can we give an education that's really spiritual? We need, we need masters. Like we need spiritual masters to, to build that really. So I wanted to share. Yeah, we're, we're coming out of the, the last, uh, you know, we're coming into this new uh, yuga, right? Um, sorry, I'm, I'm not... Treta. And end of the Dvapara Yuga, yeah, yeah. Dwapara, so we're going into Dwapara. Treta Yuga. Oh, we're going into Dvapara Yuga. No, no, we're in, we're in Dvapara Yuga. We're going yeah. into Treta Yuga, the next yuga. So, yeah. Okay, so we're in yeah. Dvapara Yuga. So this, okay. and only for 122 years or so, is that right, roughly? Yeah. Can't remember how long yeah, left. Been been more. Yeah, so, <laughs> give or take. Um, but you know, it, it's it, there's a transition period, right? And uh, it's it's gotten the West uh, to a pretty good place in material comfort. So um, I think uh, Yogananda was uh, pretty complimentary, actually, in, in some of the facts um, that I read. So it's it's not to be up too hard on any teachers listening um, to, uh, to to the to the show. But Priyank, maybe you have some stories that. Uh, you would like to share about this? Yeah, I do. So I was, I was churning the autobiography of a yogi. And you know, that I, was, I wanted to share, let me share more, a bit more of my own experience. There's yeah. something that the um, US has that the UK doesn't have is the summer camps. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they have like in the, in the summer vacations, they, they literally send their children for, uh, Sarah Mike, I think my voice is echoing in your thing. Could you mute? Um, you. Okay, um, so I was uh, saying, yeah, so they have these summer camps, so they, over the summer, they would send your, your, your child for three, six weeks to, a, you know, rem it'll be in a remote corner of some forest or mountainous area, and I, I actually went and did that as volunteer work for one, one summer, and it was really good because everything was, as we've just talked about, everything was outdoors, you know, sports activities, classrooms, you know, learning various things like, you know, wildlife, and it was just, and I've actually, I've actually done a bit of school, you know, 
traditional schooling as well and it was just so much more engaging to teach in that environment as a teacher than compared to um compared to you know in the classroom and also like well I actually went the the, the camp I was at was a camp for underprivileged um, children so, and and usually with that uh, with that kind of group you have a lot of troublemakers etc but when 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 they're engaged in um you know in in something that's interesting and also that is a unique experience because it's not in their usual you know day-to-day life etc they're then that kind of the, that intention that uh, inclination to you know misbehave and be naughty is is like subdued a little bit and it's just so powerful and it was such a great experience for me to to teach in that environment and and I've, i really even now is like you know i'm probably too old but i really want to go back and do that again because it was so enjoyable yeah. um yeah so but in terms of yoga and stories i have a good one uh, let me yes so Yogananda when he was in Ranji he would do similar things uh, he would uh, go out into nature with the boys so here's a story that he shares in the autobiography please do not go into the water let us bathe by dipping our buckets I was addressing the young Ranji students who were accompanying me on an eight mile hike to the neighboring hill the point before us seemed inviting but a distaste for it had arisen in my mind most of the boys began to dip their buckets, but a few lads yielded to the temptation of the cool waters. No sooner had they dived than large snakes wiggled around them. What shrieks and splashes, what comical alacrity in leaving the pond. <laughs> How cool would that? That's such a cool story. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah. so, so is he saying here that he had a, a sense like a a bit of a for for warning somehow intuitively definitely it says that so the, the words he used it says but a, dis- a distaste had for it had arisen in my mind but mm-hmm. a distaste so yeah no doubt he had a vision of things to come but also i've heard that um yogis and mystics are generally quite adept or in tune with snakes mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and and, and their, apparently their energy bodies are quite developed snakes and serpents so like yogis can very easily tap into that and manipulate that and that's why we see like shiva with 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 a cobra around you know around his head and that's why krishna could in his youth go into a, a pond of snakes and take take out the one that was disturbing all the cows etc and yeah that's, mm-hmm. that's a, it's a related story i suppose that's very interesting because at least in the Catholic religion, the snake is the representation of evil. Evil. Mm-hmm. So yeah, and, and you can see like um, the Virgin Mary with the snake under her feet. So I don't know if it has some con- similar connotation. Like I conquered evil. I conquered the snake. Yeah, I, th- I think it. I, I jump in, guys. If, I'm, if you guys know more than I do, but I think. Uh, Natalia, myself, and this is something to do with this serpent energy in the spine, spinal awesome. cord, the Kundalini. I think there was something to do with. That. I don't. I'm not sure that it's it's um, meant to be. You know, the, the sign of your your um, material sense of you have to overcome overcome this. And uh, yeah. I, I don't know. There's something about that. I'm stumbling over my words here, but uh, I find that fast. I'm find that, I find that fascinating myself. But I haven't quite got the answers. To it's myself. actually it's a mystery. A, yeah, there's actually um, an interesting uh, question I had because um, you're in Ireland, Chris, right? So mm-hmm. there, isn't there that urban myth that Saint Patrick banned all the snakes of Ireland, and now there aren't any? Is that actually true? Nice. <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good question because St. Patrick's Day, uh, yeah, everybody just boozes for it. But um, yeah, yeah, the, the 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 background is supposedly that it drove all the snakes of Ireland. But um, no idea, <laughs> no idea. But I, I think there is something to do with serpent energy, uh, mm. the, uh, and and how actually energy flows around the planet. There's actually in an in Eastern teaching uh, in China, you know, they have the dragon and this is there's a serpent and things like this and something to do with Maya, the flow of energy and uh, how, how energy flows around the planet as well. It can be seen mm. by seers and things like this. So I think there's, it's a whole complicated, twisted 
story that's probably just jumbled up in some yeah i i don't want to come out of this being like anti-snake or something but (laughs) i (laughs) but um i remember that uh, that chapter in the autobiography where Shri Tesla describes the he describes the um, astral plane and one of the things he says there's no snakes there really? uh, yeah yeah he says, no, such a random thing. No, no snakes yeah oh, okay. so I was always wondering about that yeah. mm. no, so, so like no, like nothing from the animal kingdom um, I, he, didn't say that. he didn't yeah. say that he didn't say that I think he was referring to like this uh, animals that us people fear like snakes and other I think he mentioned some other things like mosquitoes I can't remember he yeah. mentioned some other things that um we usually don't like on this material plane so hence yeah in the yeah. astral plane they don't exist there is another okay. talking about astral planes there is another story that I can share please do so the adjacent chapter to the Ranji chapter is Gashi Reborn uh, which is a fascinating chapter so i'll just read about paragraph sorry if, Mark, i think you have to mute your sorry thank you. <laughs> if, if i die will you find me when i am reborn and bring me back to the spiritual path he asked amid sobs so this is a boy called gashi um so 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 yogananda if you imagine he was obviously a guru as well in that school as well as a regular teacher so these boys were privileged in that sense that they actually got to go to a school where you're not just, just not just a teacher but a guru, right? So we can he can ask such questions about um, about that. But in in this in this sense, actually, what Yogananda had done, he had just blurted out, "Oh, Gashi, you're you're not you're no longer going to be with us." And then and then the events actually later unfold in that way. But then then it said um, he says I felt con- constrained to refuse this difficult occult responsibility, but for weeks afterward, Gashi pressed me doggedly. Seeing him unnerved to the breaking point, I finally consoled. Yes, I promised. If the heavenly Father lends his aid, I will try to find you. And uh, the rest of the chapter goes. Um, he, you know, had to go to, uh, out of the school for a little while and he told Gashi like don't leave the ashram like I can I can I can protect you here but don't leave the ashram or the school and then his parents forcibly came and took him even though he was and then a few weeks later he, the, the boy passed away as, as Yogananda had predicted and later in the chapter he actually goes out and finds the reborn Gashi and um and and yeah, it's a fascinating chapter, and uh, yeah. I highly recommend you read it. But you know, the, the point I wanted to, the biggest point I wanted to convey was the fact that the he took, he didn't just form the school; he actually took ownership of the lives and the souls and the spiritual progress of probably each of those children. And this is such a beautiful and mm-hmm. powerful story that Gashi reborn. Mm-hmm. There's a, there's so many great stories. That, that was that was such an interesting chapter uh, in the autobiography for me as well because it seems so exciting to you know to have been there. Um, um, I think it was the, the story of the deer, right? This deer that was yeah. there and um, it was uh, it was dying and and Yogananda really didn't didn't want the little animal to die, but uh, it spoke to him in in the astral or spiritual uh, form and. And asked, pleaded with Yogananda to be allowed to die. And I just thought these stories from that time are yeah. so so fascinating, right? Um, so much going on. Um, and you know, I, I wanted actually to touch on uh, j- just um, one thing here that Yogananda really uh, uh, talked about his uh, family having a vision for him to work really in the with the real work, real roads. Um, I don't. I don't exactly know. Probably as an engineer, was it? Um, but they, no, it was, it was like a, a, a superintendent, some level. So it was like some middle management position. He actually, yeah. they, his father got him a job as well, and then yeah, he turned it down when he was really annoyed. <laughs> yeah, and, and he talked about why and and you know the the purpose of having uh, relation, his, his, you know, a, a job or a role in um in this life that he felt that it was something close to his heart and he was really deeply into spirituality and he wasn't really going to get that from working uh you know, on, on 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 the trains uh, as much as he would 
through to school. So he really followed his own path. And it was something very inspirational, really hearing him talk about it the way he did, because so often, you know, as I said before, we kind of jump out of the universities, as, as you're going to understand, and, and run into marriages and jobs and things. And it's like a car crash, kind of this slow car crash, you know, and, and we're still caught up in thinking that this is this is what we should do because it's dictated as society dictates okay. it for us. Um, and it's, there's such a great teaching in there is listen to yourself. And Yogananda says that, like, you know, look and observe yourself, analyze yourself and see what you're passionate about, because you will have these passions from maybe prior lives that you can nurture these these positive, good passions. Um, Correct. You, you've, you've got a book yes. in front of you. So. Yes, I was just reading the Gita today, or yesterday, actually, I was doing a live Gita reading. And um, uh, this is a personal one for me because I, we, me, my wife and I don't want children. Um, mm. But obviously, we, that doesn't mean that we don't want to serve. Um, but Sri Yogeshwar talks about this and this in this chapter, in the chapter preceding the Ranti chapter as well. And he says, um, uh, he who, Sri Yogeshwar says, he who rejects usual worldly duties can justify himself only by assuming some kind of responsibility for a much larger family. Um, which hits uh, a chord for me, obviously, yeah. because I don't tend to uh, delve into family life much. But that doesn't mean that uh, I get an easy life and potentially it's probably mm. going to be more difficult because I won't be restricted to a couple of children that I might have and there might be a much larger family that I need to take care of. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's funny, sad guru on the side note, I keep, you know, I, I feel like mentioned sad guru, it's like, like there's, there's plenty of people on the planet, you know, <laughs> there's plenty of us, you don't, you don't necessarily need to add. Um, but uh, yeah, cool. Um, I, there was, sorry, there was one more thing um, that I did want to say that uh, I thought was quite uh, interesting um, that Yogananda had uh, a bit of um, a chip in his shoulder to some degree and Sri Yukteswar quickly um, quickly uh, fixed that for him and it's in chapter 27 of of, um, of the autobiography uh, when he was talking about finding the yoga school at Ranchi uh, and uh, he's asked uh, by Sri Yukteswar here uh, why are you adverse to organizational work and Yogananda reflects uh, master's question startled me a bit. It's true that my that my private conviction at the time was that organizations were hornets' nests. It is a thankless task, sir, I answered. No matter what the leader does or does not, he is criticized. And the response came, do you want the whole divine chana, which is milk curd, for yourself alone? My guru's retort was accompanied by a stern glance. Could you or anyone else achieve God contact through yoga if a line of generous hearted masters had not been willing to convey their knowledge to others? He added, God is the honey. Organizations are the hives. Both are necessary. Any form is useless, of course, without the spirit. But why should you not start busy hives full of spiritual nectar? His counsel moved me deeply. Although I, I made no outward reply, an adamant resolution arose in my breast. I would share my I would share with my fellows, so far as lay in my power, the unshackling truth I learned at my guru's feet. Lord, I prayed, may thy let may thy love shine forever from the sanctuary of my devotion, and may I be able to awaken that uh, that love in others' hearts. And it's it's awesome because from there really is the seed planted for Yogananda to go do his work and organize. Uh, and he does talk about um, when when is man modern man going to organize himself uh, and and carry out his duties in an organized fashion instead of being led astray through through drifting and bad habits, et cetera. So really that conversation and that simple question. Um, from his master really you know spurred such such growth right so and it's um, what has, it, it, it is the reason why we're here it's not we weren't here yeah um, and we're organizing to, to an extent to do this work so uh, yeah. maybe no we could one of us could have been one of those seven boys in that village you never know yeah <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and we failed. Heads, we're back here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, quite probably. Um, so cool. Uh, we um, we could probably move on because there's still so much more to, yeah. to talk about, right? And um, you know, this is going to be a longer a longer podcast, I think. So. Um, we, we do see some some images, as I mentioned, probably about half an hour ago now, of uh, yeah, uh, various bits and pieces, and, and there's videos here. Uh, what the first one that we see is the same picture of, at the beginning of the minute. It's a close up of Yogananda, as I said, uh, and this is all being shown as the voiceover of Yogananda uh, speaking about the astonishing results and uh, through the concentration techniques. Uh, so we see a still image of children uh, in a semi-oval listening to a teacher. And then there's a really cool video, uh, very um, slow, uh, low number of frames video uh, of uh, a monk, I believe. Sorry, I'm not sure exactly who that is. Um, uh, and he's teaching the children uh, some yoga or asana po uh, postures. Um, and then the final one is uh, there's 30 plus boys all uh, in a room, in quite a small room by the looks of it, um, and, and they're meditating, wearing garments. Um, so we can go into these, but um, uh, I wanted to say, you know, does, does anybody have any comments on, on the semi-oval, um, you know, because it's very, very different from what we would have seen, maybe pre your reflections. Yeah, so the cool thing about that um, oval thing is it's under a very, very, very nice, big, shady tree. And this is quite a common sort of scene, I suppose, in, in rural India. So you'd have a big tree like that, and that is where everyone would hang out because of the level of shade and the coolness that it would provide. And I suppose the local authorities would acknowledge that fact because what they would do is they'd build a concrete plinth around it and everyone would then be off the floor and on this very nice cool concrete plinth and that's like the hangout area and this is quite a common scene and obviously they, but in in this case they built a kind of a school atmosphere around that classroom atmosphere which is very very cool mm -hmm. yeah yeah it looks it looks pretty awesome and it, it just reminds me actually of something i think you're going to talk about which is uh the sun being, being near the sun there's like a spiritual element to this and seeing um you know people being taught outside makes me think of oh they must have sunshine to be able to be taught outside and how, how healing and, and pleasurable that must be just to be uh, a kid learning outside very different from northern ireland i can tell you that much um and and then we have as i mentioned the, the other pictures and i want to actually in the theme of schools ask you guys a couple questions. So I'm going to share my, my screen real quick here because I'm going to take you to school. Um, bear with me. Because <laughs> uh, we see these asana postures and I wanted to test people to see if, can we see It's going to be a pop quiz. Yes, we this can is a see pop that. Quiz. Yep. So, pop quiz. Who can tell me what we are seeing here? And for anybody who can't see, um, we are looking at two children uh, with their teacher and they're doing asana postures and they are on all fours uh, bending backwards and it is a quite a tight position actually it's not i've done this many times before I'm sure maybe a few of you guys have. Uh, so you, you can tell me first off what is this posture Natal think... Natalia has to take the lead. She's the qualified okay, sure. qualified Fine. yoga teacher. Yes. Okay. Oh, I'm not hundred percent sure. <laughs> but I think this this posture is called the wheel. Yes. Correct. Yeah. Full wheel, I think, not the half wheel, the full wheel. Okay. Sorry, can you see I'm 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 messing around with my screen. Can you see a pop-up? Yeah. No, no. Okay, good. Okay, I have my answers here. So good. You can see this. Okay. So we have the postures, so we have the wheel. Um, any extra points for what the Sanskrit? Oh, um, no, 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 no,
I'm going to butcher this pronunciation to pretty much Stefan. Um, Ur, uh, Urdva Danursana. Danursana. Urdva Danursana. Can't help you. Okay, there you go. Urdva Danursana. So, there you go. What I wanted, or uh, shak Shakrasana. Shakrasana. So I wanted to say actually the benefits of this because it's, it's pretty cool, you know, learning more about yoga, um, the physical benefits that can come with yoga, I thought was um, really relevant actually, and, and something we possibly, you could argue, should be learning in schools. Um, who could tell me what some of the benefits are, some of the physical benefits, uh, and maybe even mental benefits that come from doing the whale posture? From like I can tell you from yoga in general. I don't know Please exactly from the wheel, but what what I feel with hatha yoga is like it's like with exercise, you're just exercising your muscles and your like bone structure and your I don't know nothing else than, than your body. But when you're doing hatha yoga, you're really making a connection with your spirit. I don't know exactly what is it, but mm -hmm. the 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 way the postures are designed, they somehow enhance some points of the I think the astral body, or I don't know exactly what, but chakras they touch possibly. some points that, yeah, also chakras, that, that, that's a way to say it. But for instance, in, in Bikram, that is the one that I, I really know, there are a lot of postures where, where you choke your, your throat and you put your forehead in, in, in somewhere else. It can be your knee or somewhere else. And I feel that um, first the throat is where the thyroid is and mm -hmm. the, it manages very important um, hormones as well as the um, third eye that um, is the pituitary gland and has a lot of, of the management of the hormones. And I feel that makes mm -hmm. the complete difference on what you get from a Hatha yoga class and from a regular exercise. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I, I, I feel is like you're, you're working, you're, you're really cleansing your or internal organs. Like you're mm -hmm. doing somehow with the postures, internal massages to your internal organs. And it helps them clean them. Like I remember in Bikram, we use a term, I think it's a tourniquet effect. Like when you when you um, do a twist or something like that, you leave the organ without oxygen for a while. And then when you uh, go back the twist or I don't, untwisted, I don't know how to say it, it, then rushing blood, oxygenated blood comes to that same part and it's, renewed like the the organ is renewed so i feel hatha yoga is a very interesting health and well well being in a system that's yeah like, I, that's I, my experience. You, you touched on a few points here and i can say stretches and strengthens is some of the obvious ones so you could probably see from the picture here they're stretching the chest and lungs like opening them up and their arms and wrists are being strengthened, their legs, buttocks, abdomen, uh, abdomen and spine, right? So the, these are the things that we say from, from, the, from the body. And um, you mentioned there uh, the thyroid. So this apparently is great for the thyroid and pituitary gland. And then it increases energy, counteracts depression, therapeutic for asthma, back pain, infertility, and osteoporosis. There you go. Oh, yeah. And I also like, for instance, in this particular posture, you're opening your chest and in your chest, there's the thymus, which is also related to some hormones related to the sensation of love. Yep. Um, yeah. And oh, the spine, so important. Like you, you, you really strengthen your, your spine. So, mm -hmm. and that's basic for meditation. So I think Hatha Yoga is a really good complement for meditation. Cool. So, so this second picture then, We'll, we'll, we'll move on. This is this is more complicated. Now, I'll, I'll give you points again, guys. Um, I want to hear you shout out. This is school time, remember. What posture is this? I would call it extreme wheel. <laughs> extreme wheel. <laughs> wheel that somebody's fallen over from. Um, <laughs> anybody know? Is it, is it the tiger? No. Not the tiger. No. Well, for, for listeners, um, it, so Sorry. the full locust. It uh, uh, yes, it is. It is the locust. Yeah, well done. Um, but yes, for the purpose of the listeners, um, what we're seeing is the same two children. Um, it looks like they're flat on their face, 
um, their neck and their chest, and then the rest of their body is actually arched up, um, up and around so that their feet are touching the back of their head. So um, this is actually the locus posture. Can anyone tell me what type of locus posture it is? This is one type of locus posture. So the locus, the first one is actually just you lying on, on your on your front. Mm -hmm. So you're lying and you kind of raise your hands and legs off the ground. So you're lying on your belly. But this is the different level. Full no takers. Locus? Full locus. Full could, locus. It could be called that in some circles, but I from my search early on and I did use Google. So you know I'm not <laughs> this isn't coming from a place of deep knowledge for me, but I thought it was interesting nonetheless. Level four advanced feet to head locus. This is the multiple levels of of this uh, locus and the benefits. Anybody shout out some benefits? What what do you think is going on here? No digestive digestive tract benefits, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I, I imagine it probably does, you know, have uh, have lots lots of benefits apart from the ones that I am about to mention. But any uh, any other takers before I'll put out the answers? You probably get a really really good back stretch from this yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, you think so? It's really important. The most important benefit they say that I saw online anyway is the stimulation of the para. Uh, Symph uh, gosh, I can't say this this time of night. It's it's getting late. Um, parasympathetic nerves in the lower spinal region and the blood circulation. So yeah, it removes the pressure from the sciatic nerves and gives the uh, relief from backache and slip discs uh, in the case that aren't so. so ah, I should so, be doing that then. Mm. There, there you go. Sciatic nerves, back pain. Try to work on your lo locus. But uh, that was the school uh, session over. So. Um, Thank you very much for joining the joining the class today. <laughs> so I thought I'd do something different there. Is it called the Shalabhasana? Yeah. Did you yeah. Did you know that? Well done. Yeah, I, I knew that because I, I remember that one for some reason. <laughs> Shalabhasana. That's correct. That is correct. Good points. Good points, Corey. So that's um. So that was the pictures, and then we go on to the next scene in in, uh, in the documentary, and we see a lady. Uh, standing uh, at, at the school grounds, uh, from, from what I can see. Uh, and her name is Sandy Gray. Uh, and she says, uh, it, uh, a caption come up, comes up to say that she's on a pilgrimage um, to, to the school, how to, learn, uh, how to live school. And she says, he established, and she refers to Yogananda here, as uh, a, how to, a how to live school. I wish we had how to live schools. You have to learn your grammar. You have to learn your math and your science, but you also have to learn how to live. And so, Mike, I think you had a story to share on Sandy. Yeah, I mean, slightly unrelated, but it's related to Sandy Gray, because she's a, she's a devotee from Boston. And um, so 2020 was the 100 year founding of SRF, the 100 year celebration anniversary of Guruji coming to America. and in anticipation of that, I was thinking, I want to go to Boston and I want to see where Guruji went. And um, that was before I found out that SRF had planned so many things for Boston. They, they, had, they had like a whole separate Boston, I wouldn't say convocation, but like a really big event planned for people coming there. They were renovating the center. And anyways, I, I thought I, I should go there. And I went to Boston and I, I met Sandy Gray at the, at the Boston Center. And she was so lovely. She was like um, showing us around a bit in, in uh, Boston. Like we were very lucky to find her at a time where she was available. And, and then also she, um, her house where she lives is, it used to be Sister Yogamata's house, um, which is, um, there is this one story in the autobiography where uh, Guruji, first he doesn't go to Kashmir, then he does go to Kashmir. And I think on the way to Kashmir, I think they find a strawberry vendor on the street. He tries some of them and he goes like, I don't like strawberries. That's not, that's not for me. And then Sri Yotesva tells him, are you going to go, I'm not sure if he says America, but you're going to go to the West. You're going to have strawberries there. 
and you're going to say what delicious strawberries. And then he hears that and thinks, yeah, nonsense, or, or whatever he thinks, he, he, he forgets about it. And then um, years later in Boston, he sits there in Sister Yogamata's house and they serve him strawberries with cream and sugar. And he does say, what delicious strawberries. And that moment he remembers being in the coach with uh, Sri Yukteswar. Yeah. Okay. Um, and basically, the, I'm telling that story because we were in that house. We were sitting on that table where he was. And wow. yeah, it's, yeah. And Sandy Gray is a, is a very lovely devotee. And so, so glad that I was able to go there and meet her there. And the point she makes in the movie about how to live schools is when I mean, we just talked about this uh, totally spot on. Yeah, yeah. And did you try, sorry, did you try strawberries? She did serve us strawberries with cream and sugar, of course. <laughs> I think <laughs> had to be done, right? That is and all I, she eats now, yeah. Did I say what delicious strawberries? No, I did not, but I thought it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's epic. Um, so, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll push on. I think we're actually, uh, we probably don't have long on the recording of this Zoom session, <laughs> so we're probably going to have to kind of stitch this together somehow um, between one recording and another, Priyak. Mm. Um, but we'll, shall we continue because I think we'll have a few yeah, yeah, few yeah well, let's continue we're all let's here. see what happens yeah let's see what happens so we, we have uh, Sandy Gray of course saying you know how to live schools like we have to have obviously how to live schools and she's in these very idyllic settings and um, it looks it looks fantastic and then uh, the next scene is uh, we see a, a teacher writing on the chalkboard uh, uh, writing on a blackboard with chalk rather sorry uh, and Yogananda's uh, picture uh, is, is above uh, the blackboard and the, the, the kids are all looking very studious um, and uh, I think some of them are just checking out the camera that's there so they've got one eye on the camera and one, one, one eye on the on the teacher and uh, we, we, we see uh, in, in the next shot uh, the, the same teacher sitting down uh, and asking the, the children she speaks in a dialect I'm not familiar with so I'm hoping Maybe Priyank, I'll go to you. Do you know what the teacher yes. asks the children to sing? Yeah, so she, her name is Rani Sharma. And this class is actually in the Dakshineshwar Ashram FYSS. And I, I thought I'd be able to understand it, but it's, I couldn't because it's actually in Bengali. And Bengali is uh, quite difficult to understand for Hindi, Hindi or Gujarati speakers like myself. So yeah, that's the language. And she says... She's saying one, two, three, four, five, and Dore Rako, which means hold. One, two, three, four, five, chere, chere dao, which is let go. So they're teaching meditation. And then, uh, then she says, Amraki Shikchi Eger Teke, which means what are we learning from this? And this is another part of the class. And one of the boys says, Love conquers all. And she says, yes, love conquers all, very good. <laughs> so they're teaching, obviously, how to live. Well, firstly, the meditation and then how to live school elements, I suppose. Um, an interesting fact about the meditation, uh, I think this is mentioned in the um, autobiography. Um, let's just read that a little bit. The unique feature of the Ranchi school is the initiation into Kriya Yoga. The boys daily practice their spiritual exercises, engage in Gita reading, and are taught by precepts and examples the virtue of simplicity, self-sacrifice, honor, and truth. Evil is pointed out to them as being that which produces misery and good as those actions which result in true happiness. Evil may be compared to poisoned honey, tempting but laden with death. So overcoming restlessness, of body and mind by concentration techniques has helped achieve astonishing results. It is no novelty at Ranji to see an appealing little figure, aged nine or 10 years, sitting for an hour or more in unbroken poise, the unwinking gaze directed into the spiritual eye. So imagine if we were in one of our schools and we saw some boys or girls meditating for an hour, just this best, you can't even, imagine such a thing can you yeah i mean imagine you're you have kids and they come home from school and uh -huh. they just come home from having meditated for an hour 
It's been quite a different scene, right? Than what we have these days. Yeah. Oh my gosh. There's some, there's some really cool, I, I don't know them off uh, the top of my head, but there's some really cool um, uh, inroads that people are making in the UK, right? With meditation and, and kids. And I think it's more five minutes, I think, max for, for, for most kids, kids around the age of 10, but it's still great. And I think the results are showing kids' concentration levels are going up and, and they're studying this more. So in the UK, um, it, it's, it's making inroads. So. I'll, I'll throw that in there. <laughs> I, have <hope. laughs> I have heard also of many programs right now. Like they used to call the technique of meditation mindfulness. I don't know if in, in the UK it's the same, but here in Colombia, mindfulness is very uh, popular right now. And um, I've heard of many schools that are trying to practice in mindfulness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Mike, maybe I cut you off there. Oh, yeah, it is. I was just going to say, um, at my last employer, we had meditation sessions every week, um, twice a week. So I think it's making inroads on most. It was also in the UK, though. So maybe the UK is the place. <laughs> but I'm sure it's happening in other places as well. Colombia. There you go. And um, mm -hmm. I think generally this kind of knowledge is spreading. And I feel, I mean, it is, um, if people wouldn't like the effects, they wouldn't be doing it. So, and I, I, I feel like I see this more and more and, and it's, it's becoming very trendy and it wouldn't be if it wouldn't have a great effect on people. Yeah, awesome. And really with that, we have the minute and it's such a beautiful way to finish the minute. Uh, as, the, as the kids said, um, talking about love, really love conquers all. Um, and it reminds me just of John Lennon, right? You know, all you need is love. And it, it's such a nice way to end the minute. And yeah, and really uh, we have in the next minute, uh, a, a, an appearance of uh, Sri Dayamata. So I um, uh, can't wait for that. Uh, so I would like to thank really Natalia for, for joining us on this minute. I hope you've enjoyed it, Natalia. How, how have you how have you found your time? My pleasure to be here. <laughs> of course, my pleasure. Lovely. So any reflections really from anybody? Have we missed anything? Have we do we want to add anything else? Priyak? Yes, one small thing. So we mentioned, Mike just mentioned about imagine if your child had come home after an hour's meditation. And so I think this this part of the autobiography is, is relevant for that comment. Very early in my career as an educator, I discovered that boys who may impishly delight in outwitting a teacher will cheerfully accept disciplinary rules set by their fellow students. Never a model pupil myself. I had already I had already sympathy for all the boyish pranks and problems. <laughs> so in that in the school, they would that if I read that correctly, other boys would set the punishment or they'd set their own punishments uh, for misbehaving mm -hmm. or not doing work, etc. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Rather than the teacher saying, do this or else you're setting your own in rules, which is quite an interesting model isn't it using willpower essentially yes, self and kind of what you were saying like of, of having an education that is based on on the soul of the individual like what he needs what is he feeling what is he processing um so i think it would be such a different world if we could really establish that yeah awesome uh, well i think with that sorry there's, mike there's one more thing i wanted to say because Please. oftentimes we go like, so how do we change our current system to become better? And I feel like one, one thing that you read earlier that is so important, I wanna read this again, it's just one sentence. And it's um, about the teachers. And he says, we should never neglect teachers for they are soul molders, mm -hmm. which I find actually any approach of making schools better means like you have to improve the team you don't have to improve them as people but you have to give them more resources more education and mm -hmm. they are basically the ones who who have so much responsibility like having those young people who just come from the astral plane and teaching them about living mm -hmm. yeah 
yeah, the, the importance of that can't be stressed, right? The ramifications and the and the and the wealth, material and spiritual wealth, there you know thereafter to be unlocked uh, through through getting there right at the beginning. Awesome. Well, look, uh, I think we're kind of running out of recording for this session. <laughs> yeah, Chris, we're trying to close. We're trying to close. I'm trying. I've got a perfect close because uh, okay. there's one more quote that Natalia is going to read, and then we'll close. Thank you, Priyank. Actually, like this quote that you you sent me, um, Vikram's wife, her name is Rahashri, and she had a CD of music and with poems, and she has a song with this poem. So it this reminds my, me. Of that. Yeah, my favorite, one of my favorite poems of all time. Oh, Go. Where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken up into fragments by narrow domestic walls, where words come out from the depth of truth, where tireless striving stretches its arms towards perfection, where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way into the dreary desert sand of dead habit, where the mind is led forward by thee into every whitening thought and action, into that heaven of freedom, my father, let my country awake. So beautiful. It's from Rabindranath Tagore. Rabindranath Tagore. We'll see you next time. Thank you so much for your invitation. Pleasure to have you in here. Thank you.